Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, also, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, my name is Thomas Strasser. I'm organizing together with my colleagues and colleagues from the uh, Institute uh, Mihao Propin uh, this uh, online training series on the digitalization of smart energy uh, systems. Before we start with the uh, details um, and also the, the content part, just a few uh, sorts of uh, uh, few uh, rules uh, and guidelines uh, in order to run the, uh, the training series for the, uh, during this week uh, smoothly. So uh, the uh, um, material will be, or the, the uh, training will be recorded. Uh, we share the presentations and the recording afterwards uh, with all of you after the end of the last uh, uh, training pa part. Uh, all microphones are muted except uh, for those of the uh, speakers. Uh, you are not uh, able to share uh, your uh, webcam. Um, we prefer to have the, because there are so many people in the in the meeting, we prefer to um, uh, get questions uh, via the uh, Q&A part. So you should be able to uh, uh, state questions here in the Q&A chat. Uh, please feel free to, to, un uh, to ask them during the uh, training. Uh, uh, part um, during the uh, yeah, uh, training series part during the lecture today, uh, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, and on Thursday. Um, this event is organized by three different European projects. Uh, the IRIGRID 2 project, it's a research infrastructure project that deals with validation and testing um, of uh, smart energy systems. Uh, uh, provision of lab access. Then we have the Synergy project. Uh, that is a project that um, uh, dealt, uh, dealt with the building in smart and uh, innovative energy management uh, activities. Uh, and then we have uh, another uh, European project called the Resiliate. Uh, that is on the resilience of cyber physical energy systems. Uh, and uh, out of three uh, of these three projects, uh, my colleagues, uh, and uh, our colleagues from the Mia Pupin Institute. We will guide you uh, through the uh, four lecture parts that are being uh, that are taking place uh, today uh, with the part on modeling and simulation of integrated energy systems. Uh, uh, that lecture is being provided by my colleague Edmund Biedl. Uh, tomorrow uh, we have the uh, uh, synergy part. Uh, um, this is uh, presented by Valentina Yanev uh, and her uh, colleagues uh, from the Institute Mihai Pupin. On uh, Wednesday, we will have uh, another lecture part uh, presented by me and my colleague Philip Postel Andrin. And on Thursday, we have the last part uh, given also by my colleagues uh, Katalika Viluta and Denis uh, Toetti. So that's a very brief introduction. Um, as said, uh, everything is will be recorded. You can listen afterwards also when we share all the uh, information with you. So it's time for me to hand over to Edmund. Uh, he will uh, give you a detailed overview about the modeling and simulation of integrated uh, energy systems. So Edmund, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thomas. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So uh, first of all, let me introduce myself briefly. So my name is Edmund Wiedel. I'm a senior scientist here at the Austrian Institute of Technology. And in the last 10 years or so, I've been working a lot, among other things, on uh, yeah, on the modeling and simulation of integrated energy, system, uh, energy systems and that comprised uh, different things. So multi-energy systems, for example, power and heat, but also, for example, power and ICT and other things. Uh, and that's uh, why I would like to share some of the insights that, that I and my colleagues had during the last years and, and to show you how, how we do things. Uh, before I go into the subject itself, I would also like to give credit uh, to, to Professor Peter Palensky from TU Delft and Jan Sören Schwarz from, from the Office Institute in Oldenburg in Germany. Uh, who were also uh, providing a lot of content for, for, for this lecture. Okay, but uh, let's go into Medias Res. Um, so here's the outline of, of what I will talk to you now in the coming hour or so. Uh, so it's basically structured into three parts. The first one is uh, introduction to co-simulation. 
So it also it already foreshadows the, the modeling and, and, and simulation approach that uh, I will be introducing and, and, and showing in some detail today. So I will tell you what co-simulation is and why, why, why it is a feasible approach for, uh, for, for the assessment of, of, of future energy systems uh, where you uh, integrate more than one domain. Uh, part B will cover Mosaic, which is a framework for co-simulation. So uh, there's many tools around for co-simulation, but in, in this uh, particular tutorial, we will use the Mosaic framework. Uh, so I will cover briefly the basics and also give you uh, a quick tour to uh, through, some, through some notebooks that are also available online uh, where, can, where you can play around a bit with Mosaic and, and learn the basics. And last but not least, so there's this part C, uh, where I would give you an example of a real or full-blown uh, multi-energy network application uh, where I will basically use all these things that I, I've shown in part A and part B to uh, so put them together and show you how to assess in detail a coupled thermoelectric network with power to heat and everything. Okay, so let's start with part A with the introduction. So, well, I guess most of you already know that the uh, decarbonization of the energy systems is basically uh, the driver between most of research in, in energy today. Uh, you know that we want to go from the system as it is now, uh, where uh, basically uh, uh, you you know where you basically in the, the current system, the centralized system, you know very well. Uh, how you do how to do controls and operations you know how how to keep things stable you know with uh, uh, with ha having inertia from generators and things like this and it's it's very well known uh, how, how or that, that, that now, nowadays there, there's a very uh, well there's a system in place that works very well where you know which roles are there who are the stakeholders and, and how are they related to each other like dso's and tso's and, and the energy markets and everything the problem is, of course, uh, uh, it's uh, it's not good for the environment, and it's also actually quite costly if you if you look at it. And so the idea is to transition to this new to, to this new era of, of energy systems where everything is distributed and renewable. It's good for for the environment. It's probably even cheaper. Uh, but of course, uh, the other things that I mentioned, so about control and operations, stability, role stakeholders, etc. Those things are not as well understood as we would like them. And, and this is, of course, a challenge in, in making this transition. So basically, as I said, we, we want to go from, from carbonized and, and, and non-renewable and fossil. We really want to go into a system that's digital and distributed uh, and, and, and where there's a lot of different, uh, uh, different domains that should work with each other in, in, in a well-integrated way. So this is this is kind of the, the idea, and this is also the reason why we need new tools because basically in, in, in the system as we, as we have it now, we have basically silos of, of different domains. Let's look, for example, the power system. Uh, so that worked well on its own for for you know, for decades. Everybody knew how to do that mostly, uh, and and it worked well. And, and nowadays we have you know digital transformation. Uh, renewable energy, distributed renewable energy systems, and sector integration, and so on, and all of these things that that uh, basically came easily or that or that were already well established uh, have to change now, and we have to figure out how, right? Uh, and uh, this is kind of also the challenge when it comes to assessing these systems. And if you're now one of the people who who have to do planning and operations for these new systems, then this means you are uh, confronted with a lot of questions. Uh, suddenly your systems become even more complex and even larger and you have to make difficult decisions decisions that you did not have to consider before so they are multidisciplinary so if you if you think about sector coupling you're not in one domain anymore only but for example you, you probably have power and heat and gas and probably even other other sectors that that uh, you have to uh, take into account you have a lot of uncertainty that you did not have before I mean, before so until now, basically you you had uh, uh, the centralized plants, and uh, you could basically uh, let them produce more or less, and but that what was very regulated. But with you know, with intermittency of renewable energy resources and so on, this is this is much more complex, and especially then if you include multiple domains, that that gets more and more. Uh, 
And yeah, of course, all of these strings are basically boiled down to a lot of complexity that, that also basically collides with time, time, time constraints. So for example, you know that you have a lot of wind to uh, typically during some times of the day, but not necessarily when you need it. The same is true for solar and, and, and others, uh, probably even hydro if, if, if you look at uh, uh, if you look at yearly patterns. And of course, uh, I also mentioned it before, the stakeholders are important. So you get, of course, more stakeholders if you have a bigger system and a more complex system. And, but in the end, uh, what, what the people who, who plan and operate the systems would like to have ideally is kind of a very simple approach of how to do that. It should fit on the back of an envelope, basically. Uh, and the question is, is that still feasible to do? Well, probably back of an envelope, uh, yeah, could, that could be uh, that could become a problem, but still, I mean, what can help us in, in doing all the planning and operation of system for the future are numerical models. So that's not something new, even for the power sector as it is today. Uh, I, I think so that would not be thinkable anymore without uh, uh, numerical tools, simulation tools for the network and, and so on. Uh, but I think uh, with go, going a step forward, including even more systems and, and, and more domains, it, it becomes clear nobody is able to handle everything and definitely not on, on the back of a of an envelope or on some some piece of paper so typically those things get so complex that you basically need <clears throat> an American model that represents the system that helps you already during the design phase for example for doing things like dimensioning uh, checking the stability of a system but also interoperability checks uh, th these are some of the things where uh, American models can help you but then it can also support you in operations. Uh, for example, uh, before you take a decision, you can can use one of these numerical models to do kind of a, a sanity check or a safety check. But you could even go. Of, I mean, this is not part of of this tutorial today. But you could also think about using these models in in, in a real time, uh, in real time operations kind of style, and, and and go into the direction of digital twins and, and things like this. And <clears throat> of course, uh, what what you also have have been used and will be used more and more are post-mortem forensics. So example, for, for example, if you look at the uh, some of the bigger blackouts in, in, in recent years, uh, then afterwards people were able to basically show also with the help of numerical models uh, what actually happened and, and, and how things uh, deteriorated to, 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 to a point where we really had a blackout. The thing is with uh, with these future energy systems, as, as, uh, as I described them briefly before, uh, yeah, so you, you, we really transition from from domain models or from from typically domain models uh, to models that are that encompass more than that. So we go, we really go towards so-called cyber physical energy systems and also s the, the corresponding models where you not only have the physical world, which is then usually um, <clears throat> represented in our numerical models by by continuous models. So, for example, for, for energy generation, transport distribution, and so on, we, we, we typically have uh, models that are motivated by physics or, or, uh, or areas that, or, or engineering areas that that, that are based on, on, on the physical laws. Uh, but for this new kind of, uh, or for, for the cyber physical energy systems, we in addition have, of course, first of all, first and foremost, we also have information technology. So we want to make everything smart and include intelligent controls and Nowadays, also, you know, <clears throat> do a lot of um, data driven analysis with AI and, and machine learning and, 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 and so on. And these things are, are typically discrete models. So, in contrast to, to the physical world, you don't describe them typically by, by differential equations or things like this, but re you really have event based models of controllers, of, of communication infrastructure, of software, etc. And then, in addition, I already talked about it a bit. You, you also have roles and behavior, so uh, different entities and people and, and companies, etc., that and, and markets that are acting uh, in, in this in, in this playing field. And uh, this is uh, a completely different kind of animal. So if you want to include things like this, you have to look for game theory models where you have agents acting on behalf of each other and probably uh, acting together or against each other. Uh, and yeah, so this is uh, this is also a very important aspect here, and then, then finally, of course, you have everything that where you basically have uh, basically everything which is really hard to model on 
und wenn sie an einem Atomic Level oder on, on, ja, on, uh, ja, we, we really have insight in, in, in things what happen, so basically you can, if you don't, if you lack this insight, then you have to go to, to aggregate models, stochastic models. Uh, typically we do this for uh, things like weather or uh, the, the macro view of, of many really ritual elements, etc. So this is then where we also, in addition to these three other uh, approaches for modeling and this other approaches for, for numerical models, uh, we also have this fourth one where we really go into statistics. And so putting all these things together, uh, that's actually uh, not an easy task. <clears throat> uh, and yeah, but uh, okay, it's not easy, but why do we do it? I mean, just to recap, yeah, so the future energy system is or will be or is, yeah, it's definitely cyber physical. So we, we have to look at discrete and continuous uh, systems and numerical models, of course. We will have multi physical heat, power, gas. I already mentioned that, probably also others like water and so on. We very often also have multiple time scales. So, for example, uh, if, if you look, uh, if you think about a coupled thermal and electrical system, on the one hand, you have you might have power electronics that, that really work in, in sub-seconds range, sub -seconds range, but uh, on, on, the, on the thermal or on the hydraulic part, of course, you have completely different, uh, you have dif dif different uh, uh, time constants at, at work, and, and, and somehow they interact with each other, these different domains, but you, you have to understand how, also in terms of multiple time scales, uh, you tackle that, and that, that's a challenge on its own. Uh, from a numerical point of view and, and from the modeling point of view. Uh, these systems then are also very complex. Uh, basically, in, in, in the models, it boils down to have hidden states or emerging behavior, so really nasty things that you typically want to try to get rid of or understand as good as possible, but it's often it's not easy and, and, and you really have to, yeah, uh, to do a very uh, or assessment to 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 uh, and un understand all these things, yeah? and then in the end, as I just mentioned before, there's there's also uh, probabilistic things happening, like uh, uh, events that have a high impact, but they only happen very rarely, and or like extreme weather events or other things. And the question is how to model that. So how to uh, how to put this uh, this this whole notion of of a cyber physical energy systems with all these different parts and and, and all these constraints here. How to put that into numerical models? That's that's a good question, actually. And uh, so basically, so far we we, we have uh, two approaches. The one the one options uh, the one option is to basically model and simulate everything in one. So to have kind of one big uh, big modeling and simulation language where you can where you can do everything. So you basically squeeze all the sub models into into one tool or one language or whatever you have and, and use one kind of solo or method. Uh, that can can lead to uh, yeah that, that typically leads to, to big problems. So you could imagine uh, just just uh, uh, I don't know a good example for this. So so there are some uh, power system simulators where you not very not only able to to model uh, your, your power system or, or your electrical network by itself but you also have the pro you, you also have the possibility uh, to to write your own models uh, and of course these uh, writing your own models so the language that, that that's available there is typically very well suited to to add new models let's say for uh, for, for the typical equipment that you have in an electrical network and in theory, you can also use it to do other things. So you could uh, then also go on and, and 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 use the same thing to let's say model a thermal turbine or whatever, uh, and, and and include that and 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 in this way, uh, in the end, have a really uh, yeah, a multi-domain model. But typically, uh, as I said before, so these 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 uh, the possibilities that you have. Are typically in a way that, that give you that are really well suited to do one thing, but basically for for all the other sub models, uh, they are not that well suited. So and things typically then typically become uh, uh, very tedious and error prone, and uh, yeah, you typically have to make very harsh decisions on on doing simplifications and and so on and so on. So this is uh, 
well, I mean, it's in, let's say this is inferior possible to, to 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 squeeze everything into into one already existing tool, uh, but uh, typically it won't make you happy, and 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 uh, in, in the end, it's it's not really feasible. The second option is to have to to think about a universal tool. So basically, that you have one universal language and and solver that can do everything, and that's also basically. Uh, capable of, of describing these different kinds of physics and, and event based and, and continuous and so on and so on. And it turns out that these tools exist. Uh, actually, we will, uh, I will later on then use or introduce you a bit to one of those uh, as, as kind of a sub problem, where it's very useful. Uh, and I mean, I, I by any way, uh, I mean, by any means, I will, uh, I will not uh, Try to disencourage you to, to use tools like Modelica or, or Simulink or others uh, to, to tackle problems like this. So that, that can be very interesting or very fruitful for many problems. But if you go to bigger problems uh, and, and more complex problems, you, you very often uh, encounter performance problems. So that means uh, your, prob uh, your simulation results are correct, but it takes a long time to, 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 yeah, to simulate the systems and, and uh, yeah. If performance is key, this is probably not your preferred way to go. So the third way to go, and that's uh, the one that uh, I will look uh, into more detail now in the following slide, is to combine the specialized languages and solvers and tools that we already have. Basically, we are connecting the models and tools that we already have. We combine the numeric models and, and run the solvers concurrently. We, we solve the different parts uh, of the puzzle, the different parts of, of this integrated uh, multi-energy system resolved in collaboratively. And of course, uh, this also means that you can do multidisciplinary connected problems and, and team. So, so you can have teams that can really work on multidisciplinary and connected problems, where you probably have uh, different experts for different subjects and they can put their expertise in their specific tools and then put things together at runtime. And this is then basically what we refer to as co-simulation. So here's an example. You could have a, a big system with, you know, with electric vehicles and charging stations and the transmission or distribution and transmission net, and uh, and so on and so on, and yeah, and the, and the battery and and so on. And so on. All these things that you have nowadays in your systems, and you could basically, or I mean, the idea is to, to really for for each of these subsystems, basically you have a simulator for your car usage. You have a a specific simulator for the for the battery, a specific simulator for for the network, for the communication network, probably one for the, the power electronics in, in your charging station, then another one for the distribution grid, and and, and probably even one for a, a simulator for our energy market. And you put those things together, let them simulate in real time, or let them simulate uh, concurrently, uh, and and in this way basically get the full picture by putting together the individual parts. Doing this in real time can be uh, kind of easy, so big quotation marks still, but uh, so it's uh, kind of almost like doing it in the real world. So, but instead of like putting a real car and a, a real battery and, and a real power system, you can uh, you can basically, I guess most of you have uh, already come around to it in some term or another. You can basically go into hardware in the loop experiments uh, where you either have real hardware where you basically have the opportunity to do so. Uh, like, for example, a battery is probably not that big. You can put it into your lab and have at least one battery, but uh, then probably your lab is not big enough uh, to fit the uh, entire car that's driving around or distribution system. And those things you could um, uh, you could simulate with dedicated uh, with dedicated real-time simulators. Uh, yeah. I'm, I guess you most of you have already seen those things. Uh, and basically, you can put those things together. So your hardware, your 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 emulators, your software that emulates other systems, and they are basically synchronized implicitly. So the synchronization of these different particles is, of course, important. You have different simulators that work independently, and they have to work together. And if you do it in real time, of course, this uh, synchronization is implicit because all of those uh, they they work uh, in, in their own time and they exchange data as they vote if they were real components or if they are real components, like they vote also in the real world. So typical example, uh, as I said, I guess most of you have seen these regs in, in one lab or another. There, there are different vendors that provide them. 
And this is a typical example where you, you have a real time simulator where you put a uh, detailed, a reasonable detailed uh, system model, in this case, uh, uh, a model of uh, electromagnetic, electromagnetic transients of, uh, of a transition, uh, sorry, of a, um, uh, no, of a transmission system. Uh, and then uh, you add like uh, amplifiers, the power interfaces, you you run a part of the equipment, like the, the, the uh, in this case, it's electrolyzer and so on. You, you put them into your lab, you, you let things run together. And if you set up everything correctly, of course, uh, that, that's also subject on its own. It's also tricky. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's easy, but but basically, if, if you do everything correct, then it's well known how to co how to connect those things and to to make um, or to, to to make simulations that are at least very close to what would happen in the real world, and that give you a way to assess your systems probably with new types of technology and so on. So, however, if you don't want to do that in real time because uh, real time is probably too slow for you, if you want to have a simulation of a full year, you don't want to run that thing for for a year in your lab before you have an answer. Uh, probably then you have to run it a hundred times, uh, so that's uh, that's not the way to go. So you want to go much faster in real time. Uh, basically, you have to do this synchronization of the simulators uh, in a more clever way, and this is where co-simulation algorithms come into play. And basically, what they do is uh, first of all they initialize the simulators, but then they are also um, they are also responsible for the, the, the simulators and actually the solvers that that, that they use. To, uh, to really synchronize between each other and to exchange the data in a way that uh, still makes it uh, basically plausible or to, to make it consistent with what would happen if you run it like in like in real time. Yeah? So that that's kind of the uh, this is kind of the art between co-simulation. That's this uh, that, that's this algorithm that or, or the different types of algorithms that you run uh, uh, to synchronize the different the different models with each other. And uh, of course this is not really easy because that in includes uh, in the end this is this boils down to having a complex coupled uh, workflow for a simulation. So if you have multiple simulators, you also have multiple models, you have to couple differential algebraic equations and things like this. Uh, for anything that's feasible in the real world, then you also have to think about how to handle scenarios and and and, and so on and so on. Yeah. So uh, that that that's that that's not straightforward. And uh, I would say, I mean, kind of as a if you want to, let's say as a uh, as an exercise in the course, it make, make it may make sense to to write your own uh, co-simulation algorithm. But in general. It's a good idea to 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 master this complexity by tools that are already around and that that you have already available. Uh, one thing that these tools typically do is, uh, as I already mentioned several times, is the synchronization. Yeah? And there, you, uh, I mean, it may, may look or it may sound quite trivial uh, if you look at it uh, at first, but in fact, uh, there's there's a lot of things that that you have to consider here. Uh, so, for example, if 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 you look at uh, if you look at this schematic, uh, the upper line basically represents the the timeline of uh, simulator one, and uh, the one below that uh, the timeline of simulator two. Uh, the axis or it's yeah, the axis is, is the time axis, so it's a timeline. Uh, and the idea is that the simulators they probably have their own uh, individual steps where they. Uh, Internally, basically integrate the differential algebraic equations, or however, whatever type of uh, model you have, they, they solve it, and they will typically have their own internal time step, which is here referred to as micro time step. And at certain points, uh, the uh, simulation, uh, the co-simulation algorithm will tell them to uh, to exchange data, and these uh, synchronization points are the the so-called macro time steps. Uh, where basically the synchronization really happens. Uh, and so and here the details become a bit fuzzy because, uh, well, not fuzzy, but, but here things become interesting uh, because these, uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, this, it, it somehow, uh, you, you, <laughs> this is somehow, how I should put it, uh, so 
it's hinted at in in, in this in this picture because uh, simulators they they basically I mean simulators are, are written by by clever people who who try to optimize the simulators and time steps for especially if you have continuous systems with integrators so the time steps that you're using they are uh, they are very very well chosen typically with uh, by by integrators that that uh, are very efficient uh, and these micro steps not necessarily coincide with the macro steps and, and so th th there's a lot of technical details that, that you have to overcome and, but and the next thing is that if you you have to think about how to exchange the data yeah? so this is uh, this this is shown here so this this coupling principle you have to understand how you exchange the data in a way that makes the simulation stable so there is uh, here uh, the, the low the upper part basically uh, is what's often referred to explicit coupling or, or uh, Gauss seidel okay just the name but basically that means uh, you make a macro step and then uh, simulator one uh, forwards its latest data to simulator two and simulator two forwards its latest outputs uh, its inputs to simulator one and then you just make another uh, macro step and, and and you do it again and again uh, but it's uh, actually quite easy to show uh, with simple examples that uh, if you do things like this uh, systems uh, it's really very simple systems uh, it's easy to show that, that this behavior so that this approach that this let's say naive approach uh, not always uh, leads to the results that you want in fact uh, it's very easy to show that you can come into uh, situations where this leaves you with uh, unstable results so that that mean, unstable means the, 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 the simulation result that you get uh, in the core simulation is not the same as you would put everything into into one big system and then then run it uh, then then run it like everything together yeah, and, and get the correct solution. So this is very often the case if you have uh, 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 differential equations or differential algebraic equations and you basically cut the systems in the wrong places and and you have dependencies from one system to the other that are not well taken care of with, with this approach. Uh, but you can uh, you can basically show you can also show that by changing this uh, this principle of exchanging data, uh, this very often can be uh, at least well you will not get absolutely rid of it, but uh, you can make it much better so that the, the results still become feasible. And in this case, you basically you let one integrator make the first step and then put its data to the subsystems to the second sub subsystem and the second subsystem that makes the next step. Or here, actually, what's here uh, indicated here as and, and mentioned here as implicit coupling, you could also have iterations where you do that uh, more than once and so on and so on. So that means your simulators don't only have to make steps that you have to synchronize, but in these cases, you might have to basically make a step back uh, to at least in theory have uh, have, have a co-simulation algorithm where you have stable and, and, and concise results. This, but uh, in fact, uh, this leads to another problem. Not all simulators are able to do that. So not every simulator that uh, that you have will be able to actually make a rollback where you say, oh, please uh, just, you know, sorry, let's try again. Let's go a step back and probably try that several times. So this is some, or this is very often not supported. Uh, so uh, very often it's very often it's a trade off between what is uh, what are the capabilities of your simulators that you have. What can they actually do? What do you want to do in terms of uh, data exchange? Uh, and also, uh, yeah, are you even aware where the problem is? And so, so in, or, uh, and the other thing is you could also make the time step smaller. That also typically helps uh, with um, uh, with the stability of the results. But then again, uh, this might uh, then lead to, to to cases where where it simply takes too long, and, and you, you again run into uh, issues with, with with the computational performance. So there's a lot of things to uh, to consider, yeah. Uh, and as a bottom line, basically, I just <clears throat> okay. I already talked a lot about uh, like the issues of co-simulation, but to basically go back to the beginning of this whole thing, uh, co-simulation can be a very useful tool. So you basically can take a coupled, uh, so, so you can couple different domain-specific tools and coordinate them in a way. That they behave like a big, like the real system, like 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 the the system of systems, basically. Uh, in theory, 
there has been a lot of work in, in, in the theory of co-simulation, so multi everything is basically possible. So nowadays for different types of simulation models and uh, approaches, we know at least in theory how to couple them in a meaningful way, uh, but you have to take care. So there is a uh, real time, real time co-simulation uh, is kind of straightforward in, in the sense that uh, synchronization is, is always correct uh, or basically correct. Uh, but it's uh, of course uh, it's real time, so it, it might take it might take too long for for what you want to show. Uh, and if you go into non real time simulation, uh, co simulation, uh, then you really have to think about the details of of co simulation, like this uh, stepping, so, so so the time steps and and the data exchange and things like this. And also, uh, of course, you also have them to take into care. You have a lot of I mentioned that before. You have a lot of things going on, different simulators with different configuration files and so on. Uh, you have to think about scenario handling, and you also always have to think about the performance and, and probably some some uh, uh, trade-offs between performance and, and, and precision and so on. So basically, that's that was uh, my my motivation to co-simulation. Um, I don't know, Thomas. Uh, are there any questions yet? Should we should could we address something here now? Uh, we could do, but currently I don't see any. Are there any questions? Uh, if, if you have some, uh, you can put in uh, to the uh, Q&A uh, chat. I hope this is possible. It should be, or at least the uh, system is configured in such a way that it should work. OK, if there are no questions yet, then I, I assume everything was crystal clear. Uh, <laughs> Okay, perfect. Then, then I go probably into the part that that's uh, so get a bit more concrete from 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 this very general introduction to co-simulation. Uh, uh, Edmund, we have we yeah. have uh, one raised hand. Uh, okay. From Tony. Tony, uh, could uh, can, oh, one moment. Uh, and, uh, you have a quest. Uh, you have a question. You can um, ask it uh, to the the. Um, uh, Michael, your microphone should be enabled. Can you try to ask a question here? Okay, if it's not working yet, then probably we can At least to uh, it. Uh, I have enabled the mic. Can you try to uh, put your question into the Q and A? I'm not really sure if this this function is working. Uh, one moment, let me. Uh, let me. One moment, give me a second. Then I activate the chat. Yeah, that's how it is. <laughs> On the first try, we have to expect some some issues. Yeah, they can also not activate the chat. Oh, ah, uh, save. We need to save it. <clears throat> Or probably I, I just continue and then we take the question as part of. No, there are already two. The first ah, okay. one uh, is there any reference available for computational time when we are talking synchronization? Okay, that's a. Uh, <laughs> there is no there, there is no absolute uh, answer to this because it it always depends on on, on what you're doing. So, uh, what models are you coupling? What, what what is your baseline reference? I mean, do you compare it to a laptop or to a supercomputer and, and so on? So I mean, that as I said, there is there is no there is no general answer to that. And I would say that in general, co-simulation, um, 
co-simulation is not something that you necessarily do to, to speed up things. Uh, very often it's, uh, if you can do without, it's, it's better not to do, but uh, if you go into problems where you have a lot of different domains that are very different in terms of uh, type of simulation models behind it, then co-simulation is probably the quicker thing instead of having uh, uh, yeah. instead of having uh, this, this uh, multi-modeling languages. But there is no there is no general benchmark on that. Sorry to disappoint. And we have a second question. Uh, can we co-simulate power simulator with network simulator? Yeah, sure. That's uh, that's uh, a typically a typical thing to do. And uh, if if you look into literature, you will find a, a lot of approaches for doing so. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's even yeah, there's even software that 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 are looking exactly at this. Uh, But this is exactly one of the things where you would go. And and I know this is a, a typical uh, use case for co-simulation where, where, where people use on the one hand uh, their favorite uh, simulator for, for for power networks, uh, so for, for power grids, and uh, on the other hand uh, use their favorite uh, so network simulator for, for uh, communication grids. So this is, uh, yeah. Just, I mean, if you do a quick search, uh, uh, you will find a lot of uh, examples in literature. There's a third question. Uh, one moment, I came at the second one. Uh, can, uh, from the same um, person, can we do this uh, through internet protocols? I guess, yes. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of, okay, okay uh, this already goes into details, but there's a lot of different ways that you can implement a, uh, a co simulation algorithm. You, you could do it in a way that it's already based on internet protocol and basically includes this feature as, as, a, tra as a way of, of transporting messages. I, I've seen people doing that. If you do a generic co-simulation algorithm that looks just at synchronization by, by other means, and you can leave this emulation of the protocol as part of the network simulator. So you can basically do both, and I've seen both. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, there is another question. Uh, is Mosaic the first of its kind? Is it uh, worldwide used? I think that's easy to, uh, to answer. Uh, that's uh, th 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 the perfect question to, 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 to go into part B. Uh, so to answer the question first, no, Mosaic is not the only tool of its kind. So there is a lot of, uh, there's actually a lot of different uh, software tools or, or software. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different implementations of um, co-simulation algorithms. Uh, but as I said before, so these co-simulation algorithms, they have to do, they have to consider a lot of different things. You have uh, a scenario handling, you have uh, all the synchronization and data exchange part and so on and so on. So I would highly recommend to you not to start and, and write your own uh, co-simulation algorithm. There's plenty of those around, and I'm sure if, if, if you look a bit, you will find one that, that fits the needs. For what we were doing, for example, in, in Project Aerogrid, but also in others, uh, I know from experience that Mosaic is a very versatile tool that can help you in many in many of these uh, co-simulation use cases. It can't do everything. It's, it's not unique in that sense, but it is definitely a, a, a nice tool. It's If you have a, a bit of experience with Python, then it's also quite easy to use, uh, and that's why we show it here. So with that in mind, uh, uh, I recommend Mosaic as, as, as a good, cool tool, but uh, please, I mean, uh, please feel free and explore what's out there otherwise and, 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 and uh, make up your own mind. Uh, and, yeah. uh, Edmund, we have another question that goes back to the question, uh, to the question with the uh, power, sim uh, power system and the network simulator and if internet protocols can be used, there is in a third question, uh, if it can possible, how the data will be flow between them? I mean, yeah, this is so, so okay. This this is all, all. I mean, this question is very specific. This is not something I will really cover here. But as I said before, so there are different there are different ways to do that. You can either use it. You can either couple the tools directly. 
have to communicate, for example, via sockets and, and, and use uh, internet protocol and, and run it by, by HTTP, uh, by, by TCP IP. So then it's basically built in. Uh, or you can, as I said before, there, there are network simulators that can emulate protocols, like, for example, NS3 or others. Uh, and uh, so the both is possible, but this is very this is very implementation specific, and I would really recommend to you to uh, to 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 go a bit through literature and, and see what people have been doing there. So that there's different possibilities to do so, and uh, those different possibilities, I mean, which one is, is better for your specific use case really depends on on the details of what you want to do. Yeah. Okay, but. I think if we have further questions, we can. There will be a second and a third Q and A after, after each block. I would say. Uh, uh, yeah, the same also. Uh, the same participant ask again. I tried to co-simulate OpenDSS with network uh, NS3 uh, network simulator, so mosaic, and I uh, ended uh, give up. Uh, 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 please, can you explain how it can be possible? Okay, that's maybe a, a very detailed question. Yeah, maybe um, you can. Um, Exchange information uh, afterwards in more yeah. detail. Yeah, exactly. That, let's try that. Is so. Yeah. Okay, coming back to mosaic. So, <clears throat> as I said, as I already mentioned, so co-simulation algorithms or more general co-simulation frameworks are meant to to help you to uh, accomplish co-simulation in uh, uh, yeah for 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 real applications. Uh, in the case of Mosaic, so the main features are that you can uh, that it helps you with the integration and reuse of uh, different types of simulation components. Of course, it's a co-simulation framework, uh, so it helps you in uh, the specification of different simulation scenarios. So that's this uh, uh, scenario configuration that I was talking about before, uh, and it does all the things that I also talked about before. So this coordination of data exchange and scheduling, and in this specific case. Uh, it has the possibility to do both discrete time and discrete event simulation. So you can have so it's a it's intended for both uh, models that that use uh, differential alge algebraic equations or differential equations, but also uh, discrete event simulations like, for example, network simulators. Uh, it's available open source. Uh, there's a lot of documentation out there. Uh, <clears throat> if you what I show you now and in the coming slides, so if if you feel that uh, uh, Mosaic might be the, 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 the tool of choice for you. I really recommend to you that even after the, the very, very short uh, hands on that I will that I will give you, I, I would encourage you to, um, uh, to to check out the documentation that that, there is, that that's that's out there and also go through the tutorials. So there is a uh, uh, that there's a lot of that there's a lot of things out there that that can you uh, that, that can you get started. And the nice thing, and that's probably a bit of already an answer to to the previous question. Uh, so Mosaic is not only a simula it's not only a software package, but there's also a bit of an ecosystem there uh, for different types of simulation models. And there's, uh, for example, uh, there is uh, there is an interface for for Power Factory. There is an interface uh, for MATLAB. There is an interface for Omnet Plus Plus. So that's one of these. Uh, Simulators for, for network simulators. Uh, I know that there is uh, uh, also so FMI is, is a standard for for interfacing co-simulation components and other things. Uh, so that's possible there. And in, in general, you can also uh, plug in your own uh, Python uh, simulators and, and, and Java simulators and so on. So there's a lot of things already there. So as it's written here, there's different simulation models that are already available. You have interfaces for for other tools, wrappers for programming languages, and so on and so on. Uh, and of course, there's also some utilities like for visualization, data storage. Uh, for example, you have interfaces uh, to to HDF5, for example, for uh, for storing data or for visualization to Influx and Profile. But you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, how does Mosaic work? So the basic idea behind is that uh, Mosaic comes basically that there's the Mosaic core, uh, which is part of Mosaic. It has the component and the theme API, and it has the scenario API. And then, of course, there's the parts that the user has to provide. So, for example, if you have your own simulator with its own model, 
uh, then if there's not already a mosaic wrapper or mosaic interface available, you have to provide your own uh, component interface to connect to your simulator. And the thing that you uh, basically have to do anyway, so all, all that you always have to do, but I mean, that's the idea is that through the scenario API, you then compose uh, out of the simulators and the models that you have, you compose a co-simulation setup. You can tell Mosaic how how to I, I, I will I will uh, come to that on the on the coming slides. You can Mosaic how you can tell Mosaic how to compose these different things, how they should exchange data, how they should synchronize, etc. How long to run, and so on and so on. Uh, and then uh, basically uh, this defines the co-simulation itself, and uh, the Mosaic core will then use. Uh, the scheduler and the scene manager via the component API uh, to execute the simulation. As I said, so this component interface and the simulators, uh, if you haven't, if there is not already something available in the Mosaic ecosystem, uh, you basically have to provide one for yourself. Uh, there are basically two types of component APIs in Mosaic. The one is the so called low level API, uh, which really under the hood. Um, it's just uh, connecting to two sockets in Mosaic, so it's not internet socket. It's just uh, like the the basic socket that that can connect uh, processes uh, in, in in operating systems, and then uh, basically the, the the user has to implement all the the the, the, uh, uh, the Mosaic specific things like uh, having the interface to the simulator itself, then translating the inputs and outputs to and from JSON. Sending, deserializing, and serializing, deserializing it, and putting it in the socket, and so on and so on. So this is a kind of uh, the, the super user interface, if you want. Uh, and, and typically, you will not use that, but you will typically use the so-called high-level API, where you uh, have this uh, Mosaic API package, where all this serialization and the connection to the socket, and so on and so on, is already taken care of mostly. Uh, and you have kind of a what's here called or referred to as the base interface, from which you have to Basically, uh, on which you have to implement then for your specific simulators, where you where you only have to uh, implement a, a few functions uh, that uh, uh, that, uh, the, the comp that the component API really needs, like uh, creating a subclass of the simulator. So, if you uh, basically if you look at it uh, in, in a UML chart, it basically looks like this. So, a co simulation works like this, that you always start with this composition API. You have Mosaic on the one hand and the component that, that you want to connect to on the other. Uh, basically, you just start with an initialization. Uh, you, you get some metadata back. So uh, basically, the component tells uh, uh, Mosaic what it can do. And from this, uh, and I will talk about it briefly, and from this, then uh, the composition API will create the model and create the submodels and everything. How does this metadata look like? Basically, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's basically just uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a piece of JSON, uh, and it tells you okay, what's the simulated type? So is it time based? Uh, is it event based, or is it some kind of a hybrid thing where you also have triggers and and and, uh, and other things? Uh, so the time based would be typically. They just say, okay, I, I simulate or we synchronize the simulators every two seconds of uh, simulation time, for example. Or event based could really be that you have a network simulator uh, and you synchronize data from one simulator to the other only if a new message arrives, for example. Yeah? So that would be event, and then you do synchronization. Uh, then for the for this kind of hybrid case, you also have these triggering attributes, but they're optional. I will. Uh, I, 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 I will not go into the details here. As I said before, there's a lot of documentation for um, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of documentation around for for Mosaic and a lot of examples. But yet, what you should get here is that if you uh, if you go the first thing the composition API is that it calls this init function. It gets back it gets back the metadata and, and understands uh, what the capabilities of of this component of of the simulators are. And then basically it uses the create function to create the submodels that it actually wants. And then the simulation API takes over to so the simulation master and this simulation master then basically loops. So it, it makes steps. So it steps the simulators either as mentioned before, or as configured in the setup uh, via discrete steps or via, uh, via events. 
And after each step, you you, you always have this get data uh, function that uh, yeah basically that, that is used then for for for, for the data exchange. Exactly. Uh, just an example of, of scheduling and synchronization. So you could have a time-based synchronization in, in in Mosaic. So here you see uh, the schematic of two simulators A and B, uh, and basically you see that here A and B they don't have the same time step, but uh, in this case uh, uh, A would ha have a step length of two, uh, and and uh, B a, a step length step length uh, sorry a step length of one second, and in this case. Uh, with A providing input put to B, in this case you see that first, so th that's basically step zero, uh, you would compute the outputs from simulator A, and for uh, step one and step two, so that's uh, the initialization and the first step of B, you would then, it would then get the real data. Then after two step, uh, after two seconds, that would be the, the stepping size or the macro step for uh, simulator A, it would recompute its outputs and then again provide the inputs uh, for the next two time steps of, of B. So this is this would be a typically very simple uh, time-based synchronization. Uh, when it's event-based, that's a bit different. As I said before, um, you only do something if something happens. So if an event takes place, uh, for example, uh, so basically uh, simulator A would start at zero, so it's initialization, but nothing would happen. Then after one second, probably it, it emits an event uh, and that uh, would then trigger to 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 to, to synchronize uh, in, 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 the, in the third step simulator B, and this would then continue and so on and so on. Um, so these are very simple examples here on the left, where you only have data flow from one simulator to the other. For the more for, for most of the interesting uh, co-simulation uh, use cases, you have uh, basically a loop between the simulators where there is kind of an interdependency where uh, A sends data to B and B sends data back to A. Uh, that could be either a controller, but it could also be interesting physical systems or uh, physical system and a, um, uh, and a uh, communication network or so on. And for this, uh, uh, things uh, get a bit more complicated. I already talked about before this, this type of stepping where you implicit, explicit, and so on and so on. Uh, in the case of, um, uh, in the case of Mosaic, the Mosaic itself uh, implements the so-called uh, same time. So they call it same time loops uh, in, in literature. It's also often called super dense time, where you basically can iterate at the same time step. You can iterate the, the simulators until they converge uh, to to a certain point. Uh, I, I will not touch that. That kind of advanced, more or less advanced use case of Mosaic, but this is uh, something that that you would do on. Uh, so, so this is something that that you will learn very quickly to do if you use Mosaic because this is uh, very powerful and, and and useful for uh, if you have loops like controllers and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Coming back to the Mosaic architecture, uh, as I said before, once uh, you have your simulator coupling done, uh, you you basically then interact with Mosaic via this uh, scenario API, and basically uh, the user then provides a script, a Python script. Uh, that uh, defines uh, a co-simulation setup itself, so which simulators to connect with, so how, how to connect them, how to step them, and so on. And this basically uh, then is used to, uh, to to run the simulation. How would it then typically use? Uh, how, how would it typically look like uh, in, in, in a simple use case? So as I said, uh, it's all done in Python. Uh, it would first start, so this is just please, uh, Please bear with me, this is just pseudocode, uh, but the executable Python script would, of course, look very similar. So you would start by importing Mosaic package. Then you would uh, basically define your simulators. Uh, so you could, in this case, uh, you have a grid simulator that's uh, probably written in Python. You have a simulator for houses that's in Java, and so on and so on. Uh, and then you create what uh, Mosaic refers to as the world. So that's basically the setup for um, uh, for for all the components that that uh, Mosaic uses in one co-simulation run, and basically you say world is uh, Mosaic dot world, and you impute uh, all the uh, the setups for the simulators. Second, you would then start the simulator process. So 
basically the simulator in, in Mosaic is defined as the program that controls the models for a specific type or acts as an interface to external tools. Uh, so that means basically what you do is, for example, if is if this was uh, some, I don't know, um, if you start, so let's say this would be, let's say MATLAB, it would really start up MATLAB in the background. Yeah? MATLAB is, is like a tool installed on, 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 on your laptop or whatever. Yeah? Or if it was Power Factory, it would really start Power Factory. Uh, but as a second step, it would not only start the process, but you then also have to instantiate the models. So that means, uh, let's say uh, in this example, we have, I think, uh, the, yeah, the grid simulator would uh, initialize its model with the different, uh, uh, with, with the grid, um, with the grid model inside. You would, to the house, the house simulator would, in this case, uh, create, uh, what is it, I want to, like uh, four different house models, uh, so, so separate models, but, run by the same simulator, at least from uh, 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 Mosaic's point of view. And uh, similar with the PVs, uh, it would instantiate, uh, in this case, uh, two PV models, and it would also instantiate a controller, uh, several controllers that, that could interact with each other. In this case, the idea here would be to have a multiple uh, multi agent control system, but could be, of course, also something else. And then, finally, uh, you would connect the models basically by defining how the data should flow between them. So you could see here, for example, the houses, uh, the, the house simulator could provide uh, as an input to, to the grid model, uh, it's, uh, it's power consumption. Uh, the PV models could uh, use as an input or could provide as an input to the house models, uh, the PV generation. Uh, and of course, they could then also be connected, uh, the, the PV models in the houses then could be connected to, to the controllers. Uh, via some set points and so on, and this kind of how you would uh, in, in, in pseudocode how, how you would write it down. So you would connect those different uh, models via specific uh, via, the, via the specific input and output uh, attributes, and this basically gives uh, yeah is all the information that you need for Mosaic to then start the, 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 the uh, to start the, the simulation, and this is then what you can directly execute. I will now, so there's a there's a nice demo available. Um, there's actually a lot of, I already mentioned before, there's a lot of tutorials and documentation and demos available online. Uh, there's one specifically that you can run online in a, a, a notebook that you can run on Binder. So there's this link here. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, probably we can post it here somewhere in the chat. Let me try it like this. Can I go into the chat? Yes, but I can do it for you. You can continue and I uh, post the. I just okay. Uh, so you can go there. So it uh, the thing is uh, that Binder is is a free service for running notebooks. So it might take a while un until the whole thing starts. So which is why I don't use uh, I don't use the Binder version. I have a local version of this running at my laptop here. So I will I will run it locally, but basically if you follow the link, uh, you can do all of the things that I do now. You can also do in your browser without having to install any, any anything. I mean, you just need a browser and the internet connection, right? Okay. So if you go there, once it once it starts up, uh, you should basically you should see this. So you should see this uh, get started. Uh, this this get started node. So it tells you it's so basically a basic tutorial, and you just learn the basics and so on. Uh, uh, here in, so if it's not opened up, so it probably might look like this. So you might have to open up here on the left, uh, the browser, uh, and there you will have uh, three subfolders uh, with different types of, of demos. Uh, I will go through them just very quickly so that, that you get an idea. So if you're interested in Mosaic, uh, also in like in, in more advanced features like the same time loops and uh, available simulators like Omnet for for uh, like before we had the request of how to make a simulation run uh, between a power system and and uh, and ICT. So I mean, in basically, uh, Power Factory has all the uh, sorry, uh, Mosaic has has, has uh, simulators or simulator couplings available 
that would uh, or that actually allow to do something like this. Uh, so the other question is if if you want to use those simulators, but but in, so so all these for all these uh, advanced uh, features. There's, there's demos available and documentation is available. And I'm also, uh, so I, I know the Mosaic developers, uh, I, I know them uh, personally, uh, or at least some of them. And I know they're, they're typically quite helpful if uh, if you're stuck with something and if you need help to uh, to get your things running. But here now to start with uh, the first simple thing. So there is a there's subfolder integrate model. So if I double click that, I, I come here into the subfolder and there is one Python notebook that, that's called scenario. I double click it to open. Uh, and basically, I mean, I guess uh, you're all aware of uh, how notebooks work, right? So uh, this is very, I mean, these uh, these demos are really meant for you to, to work through it. I will not, I will not now, uh, I will not read through it now, but basically you, I, I will go through it quickly uh, and just try to, to basically get the, the gist of it. So, but as you said before, as I showed before, basically you start with importing the Mosaic package. So it's a Python package that's uh, easily available via the Python package index or poetry, uh, Conda, and so on. That's uh, easily uh, available. And what it what it does here, as I showed you before in the presentation. So first of all, uh, you tell Mosaic which uh, which simulators are available. Uh, in this case, uh, there is uh, one simulator that's called Example Sim. This is uh, here in. So if you look at uh, <clears throat> if if you look in in, in Jupyter Lab, you, you will here find another notebook where this uh, uh, simulator is is implemented, and then there's the collector, uh, which is which is also implemented here. So if you look into this, so probably this one is more interesting. So there is a this is this simulator O2 simulator mosaic IPython notebook, uh, and uh, this implements uh, this uh, simulator API as or this component API as I just uh, told you before. So I will not go into details again here, but you see it really does what uh, I explained before. So it defines the meta information that it has, uh, and basically then it defines its init function that will uh, basically give back this uh, meta information, and then there is uh, the create function uh, where it uh, basically gives back the submodels or internally it, 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 it has the logic for submodels. And it then also has it has to implement functions for stepping the simulators, which is here something very very simple. I will come to that. Uh, and it also has the function get data, which which you use uh, for uh, for exchanging the data between the simulators. Actually, the model that is used here, so this uh, simulator is, is just a wrapper for the model. The model is actually implemented here in, in this in this uh, in this notebook here, in the example IPython notebook. Uh, and that's really a simple model. Uh, that, that's just like this. So you have uh, you have this behavior. You you start you, you have basically as uh, 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 as model state you have uh, this this uh, val zero that starts with an initial value, and if every time you do a simulation step, uh, uh, the val so, so the value is updated, and it's always the previous value plus a delta, and the delta is input parameter. Yeah, and, and that's basically it. So that's really a super simple model. That that's all it that you do. You you see it's just a, a few lines of code. And as I said before, so this is the model. This is uh, packed into into the simulator via this uh, component API. Uh, in a real world example, the the model could be something that you import. That could be some bindings to I don't know another simulator that that you want to include. So the model would look much more complicated. You would have, you could write your own, uh, so either your own bindings to another tool, but you could also implement your own, uh, your own uh, Python model here that that's uh, that probably has physics inside or something else. And then via this component API, you can and, and you you providing the meta information, implementing the init function, the create function, the step function, and the get data function. The component API provides everything. That you then can use for Mosaic to uh, to run the simulation, and that's basically also what's done here. So in this scenario, uh, so that's basically the scenario. You have this model. We will instantiate three uh, three instances of the model, 
And in this very simple example, they just uh, uh, you just step ahead and write the data to the collector. And this is exactly what's happening here. So I told you before. So there's always the world, the mosaic world, we created with with, with the sim configuration that I showed you before. That, that basically gives the addresses of of, of the simulators. Uh, then you you start the simulators. This will call the init functions. Uh, you initialize the models, you connect them. Uh, in this case, you connect uh, the, the val and the delta to the collector. Uh, and basically, that's it. Uh, then you just, you know, just run it. Huh? I, I can do that here. Uh, so I, I just uh, restart run all. So it's run through. So you see that there's uh, some, some in, in, info from, uh, from uh, so it, Happened really quickly that that's why we didn't see the progress bar, but it basically went from zero to 100%. It was just a few steps. And you can really see here the collector basically uh, locked uh, what was happening. So the delta was uh, always one in this one case. Uh, so this means uh, the value monotonically increased from zero to 12 and uh, basically the same thing. They just had initial, uh, they, they had different initial values. So basically, they, they also uh, end up somewhere else. To make it a bit more interesting, uh, just let me stop. I will close this here. So that's kind of the, the simplest example that you can do with, uh, with Mosaic. Uh, it just shows you how to integrate a simple model. Uh, the most, the, the next step is already a bit more, uh, more, uh, more interesting that uh, in this uh, for the integrate controller. Basically, there is a, it follows along the same steps. It includes also now an example controller. Uh, the example controller does, I can tell you what it does. It, it's very simple. Uh, uh, there is no. Let me go back here. So basically what we does, what, what we do is, and it, it, this is basically all happening the same way as we did before. Uh, now what we do is we add this controller to the models. Uh, and the thing is this, this controller, it's called here agent, but uh, don't, but, but it, it, it's still controller. What it does is every time the value of the model uh, comes to a certain threshold, it will, it will basically count back down by minus one. Yeah? So it tries to, to keep the value uh, at, at a maximum. Yeah? Uh, I will not go through the details here. You see it's, uh, there's a little bit more going on. There's already a, there's already a, co a connection here that, that, that basically, um, um, where you basically have a circular dependency among the simulators and so on. So this is exactly the typical structure that you have when you have controllers. Uh, but as, so I, I won't get into details, but just to show you that uh, Mosaic really has all the, the tools available that you need to implement something like this. It runs through the simulation, it connects to it, uh, and, and you see here from, I mean, probably it's not so easy uh, so, uh, uh, so it's not so easy to discern, uh, but but you will see that the values here, they're not, they're not going back, to, they're just not going, it's not just counting up, but the controller is uh, every now and then is then stepping in and basically uh, reducing the value again so that that it's not uh, going out of bounds. But long story short, uh, this is kind of this example. If you work through it through through the through the different uh, through the different parts, you will learn how to use uh, controllers uh, in Mosaic like this. And in general, I mean, if if you have if you have something like this, so if you know how to do a simple uh, control loop, then of course. Uh, but once you understand that, and, and once once you know how to uh, use uh, uh, how to integrate models, which was the first step, and then there's also these uh, same time loops here in the third example, where you get even more control and final control of what's happening here. So if you know these basics, and if you work through them, if you understand them, it's quite easy uh, to uh, basically come up with more complex and 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 also more more realistic uh, co-simulation scenarios that that also makes sense. Uh, for what we want to do, for example, for the uh, simulation of uh, integrated energy systems. 
So as a summary for this part, uh, so that was a very quick introduction to Mosaic. Uh, so Mosaic really aims at the integration of reuse of heterogeneous simulation components. It's uh, very flexible in terms of specification of uh, simulation scenarios. Uh, it offers a lot of um, a lot of uh, possibilities to coordinate data exchange and, and the scheduling of simulators, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but uh, you, you can rely on, on 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 Mosaic here. So I mean, Mosaic is now in development for more than ten years, uh, and it's been in active development ever since. So it's almost yeah, more than more than ten years, definitely. Yeah. And it's always been active in development, and and there is uh, always. Uh, there's always improvements going on and updates and so on. Uh, so, if you have a if you have a simulation that that, uh, that uses discrete time or discrete event simulation, then uh, Mosaic. And, and if you if if you have uh, if you're working a lot with Python anyway, then uh, 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 Mosaic might just be the, the, the right thing for you to to get started with co-simulation. And there's also an ecosystem of, of models and interfaces and wrappers around. Uh, so it's it's really worth to take a look here, uh, take a look at the documentation, at, at the at the demos that are available, and at, at all the uh, at, at all the other stuff in the ecosystem. Okay, Thomas. Uh, I okay. I'm I'm probably not uh, the, the main mosaic expert here, but if we have some mosaic specific questions, I probably could try to take them now. Currently, uh, yeah, many things. Uh... Edmund, for that part, uh, currently I don't see any uh, questions related to Mosaic. Okay, fair enough. I think um, we can continue. Yes, perfect. So then let me come to to the final part. So I I motivated why I use co-simulation and and not something else. I motiv I, I showed you uh, how you could use Mosaic here. I will put these things together now and show you an example of. Uh, of, of using co-simulation and Mosaic for the assessment of, of a multi-energy network application. Uh, so the example application is actually seemingly rather simple. So here's the system configuration that we'll be looking here. Uh, so there is an electrical network. There's an electrical network, a thermal network, so that's why it's a multi-energy. Uh, we have consumers both for uh, electricity and, and heat. Uh, we have generation units here, two PV systems, and there is a power to heat facility. Uh, you see here that, uh, yeah, just before I go into further details, so I want to mention that this is this system is simple on purpose. So we could have, I don't know, we could do the same thing with with 150 consumers and uh, 100, uh, 200 uh, generation units, and with radial and mesh networks, and so on and so on. Of course, this would uh, make things much more complicated, uh, and it would be it would uh, require more expertise to model the things. But basically, uh, if you boil it down, it would be still a very similar example. And I mean, this is intended to be still an uh, uh, example that, that that shows the intention behind the whole thing. So it's simple on on purpose, but you will see from the results that all these things acting together, the power sector, the heat sector, the controller, the power to heat facility, the consumption, etc. They all influence each other, uh, and already the complex, uh, so, so already the behavior there is actually for such a simple system, it's actually already quite complex, <laughs> and, and not so easy to understand in detail. Which is exactly why we want to make an assessment using numerical models uh, to see uh, how things work and if we can improve things and and uh, or also how to break things, right? Okay, to go into more details. Uh, the electrical network is uh, really simple here. So we have basically two consecutive lines, each uh, 300 meters long. They're connected to an external grid. This is kind of a suburban grid or so. You could see the consumers as uh, the consumers are laid out as they, they could be uh, aggregated consumers of uh, of a small neighborhood or so. Uh, and the same for the thermal network. So we have, in this case, uh, uh, three main consecutive pipes. Uh, they are supply, so each so each with a supply and a return line, and each 500 meters long. And also, the consumers here again, so he, they are also you, they are also aggregated consumers. So you could think behind there 
uh, an even more complex uh, thermal network of uh, of more pipes and so on and so on. And it's also connected to an external grid. I already said so that there are two consumers. They are both connected to both networks, and they are basically represent aggregated loads. Uh, and yeah, they, yeah, I already mentioned that. And then we have uh, two generation units. So for each, uh, for each cons so each of these consumers uh, have PV systems, one with 150 kilowatt electric peak, and the other one with uh, 50 uh, kilowatt electric peak. But there's a small type where we fix that. Uh, what makes the thing then more interesting is uh, a power to heat facility. So this, I, I will go into more details, but uh, briefly, so there is a heat pump and a hot water storage tank, which couples both networks. Uh, and this one is uh, connected to what we refer to here as flex heat controller, uh, which operates this power to heat facility. So uh, this flex heat controller can switch the operation of the heat pump and the hot water storage tank in a way that the heat supply is either covered directly through the external grid or the power the heat facility supports by discharging uh, this, this hot water storage tank uh, to, uh, uh, to the district uh, heating grid. And there is also a voltage controller at, that's basically measuring, it's monitoring the voltage uh, at, at the consumer one, at, at the bus bar there. And, uh, it based on based on what it uh, monitors there, based on what it's measuring there in terms of voltage, uh, it tries to set the, con the power consumption set point of the heat pump in uh, in, in the um, auto heat facility in a way that uh, helps with uh, yeah, voltage control. And yeah, and whenever the voltage controller activates. Uh, uh, the power to heat facility that means that the heat pump is uh, is turned on to charge the tank with hot water. Uh, more bit of a, a, a more detailed view of the electrical network. So as I said before, it's, it's very easy. So we have the external grid, two bus bars, each with uh, with, with the loads representing uh, the consumers. On the first bus bar, there's also a, a load representing the heat pump, uh, and then there is uh, two two generators. So uh, uh, PV systems, and also on the first bus, there's this voltage controller. Uh, and the narrative in, in this use case is a bit that actually the PV. So if you look, or if you would look at uh, um, the network in detail, uh, so on, on the numbers and, and the line ratings and so on, uh, you will realize that these PV systems are actually over. They're, they're too big for. Uh, they are too, they're actually too big for, for this network. So you, you will get in trouble here. So this is, you could think as, as of a use case of an existing network and somebody is just you know, eager to, to push renewables and they, 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 they add a lot of PV systems and they say, oh, it was probably a bit too much. Or probably they, they want to, to say, okay, no, for, for some reason we want to edit, we, let's go green or so. Uh, and now we have to have a way to, to do voltage control. Uh, and this is why uh, this power to heat facility, where, where this comes into play. So this, or in other words, uh, this voltage controller and the power to heat system is already motivated by the size of these PV systems here. Uh, here's the thermal network that's also rather simple, but there is a caveat. So you see here there is in red the, the supply line and in blue the return line for the cold water. Uh, you have the consumer one, the consumer two, which are mainly consuming uh, the hot water or the heat. There's, there's also a bypass, but that's just technical detail. Uh, what's more interesting is this power to heat facility. And you see that first of all, the supply, so this, you have the storage tank, the hot water storage tank, uh, which, uh, which is basically, if you, if you unload the tank, so you, you can basically uh, pump hot water from the tank into the supply line. And when that happens, it basically draws cold water uh, from the return line. At the same time, there is this heat pump, which uses as uh, as a sink, as a as a heat sink, uses all uses also the return line from 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 the thermal grid. Uh, that means uh, if you if you use the heat pump, it actually further cools down uh, the temper the temperature of of the of, of the return line. And when you do so, so 
there is a pump that uh, basically uses the heat. So there, there's a, a hydraulic pump that uses the heat pump uh, in a closed loop to to basically uh, fill the tank with hot water. And this, so both the the pump for this this closed loop for uh, for heating up the, the tank and the pump for uh, uh, feeding the hot water to the hot water to the tank from the tank to to the supply line they are both uh, they are both uh, controlled by this flex heat controller the flex heat controller uh, is not only uh, uh, controlling these pumps but it's also taking uh, basically measurements from both the heat pump and the tank uh, in order to to come to its conclusion i will come to that in a minute the voltage controller is, is very simple, so it really just monitors the voltage at bus one, and then we calculate a power consumption set point for the heat pump by adjusting. So the, the power consumption set point of the heat pump is then adjusted to keep the voltage within acceptable limits. So you so see here, um, uh, you get the voltage measurement from the bus. Uh, you compare it with the previous value. Uh, then you, you basically have a dead point. You have a dead band. You have a gain. We have a step controller, some some operational constraints, but this is really uh, super simple. So, if you if you realize that uh, the voltage is too high, you will uh, you will in general try to uh, try to ramp up the heat pump so that uh, uh, you consume more. Voltage goes down, and if the other thing happens, so if, if the voltage is too low uh, and you're viol you're violating the band towards uh, the lower limit. Uh, then it will try to reduce. So, if possible, it will try to reduce uh, uh, the uh, the power consumption of the heat pump by uh, either uh, by either reducing it, its uh, its power consumption or by turning off it if if, if everything else fails. So basically, the, the voltage controller just sets the set point, uh, or just brings the set points. But the actual decision of what to be what to be done with the heat pump is then done by the flex heat controller. So and it, re it really regulates the heat supply for the thermal network, uh, and it operates the power the heat facility to supply additional heat for the tank, as I just said before. Uh, and I already showed you in the diagram, so it can use the heat pump to charge the tank, and this again uh, to 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 support the network. Um, but the heat pump is then operated in, in a way to respect the power consumption threshold sent by the voltage controller, and. Uh, if you want, so that there's so this this whole benchmark, so this whole set, this whole model is documented uh, in quite a lot of detail. I will show you afterwards where, where, where you can take a look at it. So if you're really interested in the details of all these controllers and everything, uh, you can find them also online. Yeah, as I just said, so this whole thing is documented as a simulation benchmark. Uh, so it has it has uh, been been uh, um, so it's it's been published online. So there's a lot of detailed documentation for um, for the networks, for the controllers, for the heat pump models, uh, for the whole setup, and and, and so on and so on. So uh, basically, if you would like to model it from scratch, uh, so all the information that you would need is uh, available in this documentation. And in addition, there are two reference implementations for the simulation setup, uh, and it's all available here uh, online uh, in uh, uh, on GitHub. I will also quickly uh, copy that link into the chat so that you can follow along. Because here again, uh, if you follow there, you will also find uh, uh, you will also find the link to uh, to to our online version of uh, of these two reference implementations on Binder, where you can just in the browser without installing anything else. Uh, Run the different models and, and and play with them and and try try out the simulation. Okay, so that's the setup and and, and the setting. Uh, the question is now: Okay, how to model and simulate this? I mean, this is uh, uh, this is the whole motto of of this tutorial. Uh, of course, the question is: We we're using co-simulation, uh, and uh, basically we broke down the system in different domains: so power, heat, and control, and we used for those domain-specific simulation tools. And here uh, on the right, you can see the partitioning of the system under test into the different subsystems. Uh, and as I said before, so and because it's co-simulation, 
we then each implemented, so we implemented each of those then with uh, dedicated simulators. So you see we had uh, one simulator was taking care of uh, the electrical network. There was one uh, for the thermal network. Uh, those were basically both uh, connected to, to a simulator for uh, this power to heat uh, facility. And then the, the voltage controller and the flex heat controller were both also separate simulators. Uh, Edmund, we have a question uh, related to this uh, uh, co-simulation example. Uh, if the heat uh, network, network operator does not have a bilateral agreement with the electricity network operator to maintain the desired voltage profile, what is the motivation for the heat network operator to constantly cycle its uh, heat uh, production assesses, uh, assets to provide this service? Is there an economic analysis considering electricity network tariffs that could provide an incentive to the heat network operator to do so? Uh. A short question though, because uh, the idea here is just to have going back here. So that's really a simulation benchmark that deals with the technical details of the simulation. We did not uh, take into account uh, any business models and so on. This is just meant uh, as a setup to show how to model it and how to implement it in a uh, in a course simulation. But yes, of course, these questions are very valid, uh, and in real world applications. This is often kind of the reason why uh, why such uh, uh, sector coupling applications uh, then are, are not uh, put into practice because because of reasons like this, because of incentives for different stakeholders and so on. But this is not tackled here. So this is purely a <clears throat> purely a technical assessment of how the different systems could work together on a purely technical basis. Um, okay, so coming back to uh, the co simulation. So, of course, uh, in this case, we used Mosaic. So, that, that's why I uh, covered the basics a bit beforehand. Uh, so, we were using Mosaic. Uh, we were using Panda Power for the electrical subsystem. And then we had, I, I mentioned it before, we had two different, uh, we, impl we have two different reference implementations. Uh, uh, in the water, so, sorry, so the, the controllers are also implemented in Python, so they are standalone Python uh, modules. I showed you before in this um, very simple mosaic demo that it's actually quite easy to, to write your own simulator and with your own model, and the model can also be controller logic, of course, um, and that's how we implemented the controllers here. Uh, but for so, so these two reference implementations that we provide, they differ in the way that we a model the thermal domain and the one uses uh, panda pipes so that's a python package uh, from uh, that's also developed by the same well at least by the same institution that also develops panda power uh, and the other one is uh, so that's a python tool and the other one is the so-called this heat leap that's uh, a modeling tool uh, for simulating district heating networks uh, and that's also, one of the reasons why this is uh, this, this simulation benchmark is quite interesting from from the technical point of view, because you can really look at the details of two different simulation or of two different implementations of the co-simulation in terms of uh, models used. And uh, so, if you want, I mean, if you're really interested in the subject, uh, that, that it can be very instructive then to you to, to take a closer look at the details. Uh, of how the simulation results differ. I mean, they are very similar, but they differ a little bit uh, depending on the chosen uh, modeling paradigms. In this case, so these, uh, as I said before, there's Panda Pipes and DC Clip. So Panda Pipes is uh, developed at the front of the Institute of Energy Economics and Energy System Technologies uh, at Castle, uh, and, and the Modelica library DC Clip is actually developed uh, at AIT uh, at also Institute of Technology. And that is uh, a modelic library. Uh, so they also work a bit differently. So Panda Pipes is, uh, I mean, you, I guess most of you are probably aware of Panda Power, which among other things can do uh, power flow calculations. Uh, and uh, similarly, Panda Pipes does pipe flow calculations. So it's also kind of a uh, quasi-static <coughs> uh, simulation of 
of of of the of the hydraulic conditions of uh, uh, of the hydraulic conditions in the pipes. That is uh, very similar to, as I said before, to to a power flow calculation in in, in the electric system. And basically, what you can do, you have, uh, as I said, it's, it's a quasi static analysis, and and you assume that the that the fluid system, so so the hydraulic system, is always more or less balanced. So you don't have uh, what what you cannot do are like th things like uh, uh, transient gradient, so, so transients of, of pressure and and, and and temperature and so on. So this is not this does not work out of the box. Uh, and you can use this for things like computation of temperature, pressure, velocity distributions, and so on in, in pipe networks. The DC network, on the other hand, uh, implements something that's called plug flow. So that's uh, using uh, nonlinear uh, pressure torque relations uh, for the hydraulic part. And uh, you can, in this case, also really analyze uh, thermal hydraulic transients in the fluid systems. And with this, you can analyze. Uh, things like uh, flow reversals and time delayed propagation of fluid properties uh, in, the, in the in the pipe system. So if that's so if you're like a, a engineer for for these two treatment systems and and you look at uh, non stationary effects, then this is kind of the things that you want to look at, especially with integ integration of renewables and so. Uh, these these are the typical things that that, that that concern you: flow reversals, time delayed propagation, and so on and so on. Uh, so they also, uh, if you use them, so in practice, their usage is also a bit different. So panda pipes, as I said, it's it's very similar, like uh, panda power. So basically, you write uh, your own, uh, you, you write your your your, uh, uh, your system simulation, or you, your model is basically Python code. Yeah. So you include uh, uh, panda pipes, and then you might know the workflow from uh, uh, from, from panda power. You you basically you build up the model in, in Python code. Uh, this clip, on the other hand, as this is a Modelica tool, you can Modelica models. In most cases, uh, you can uh, you can do the modeling uh, in a graphical manner, as is shown here. Uh, and I will go a bit, yeah. Uh, so so this is also you see you, you you don't have to write code, but you you basically can really connect components together and, and build your system in this in, in this way. Uh, but that's also from a, from let's say a more technical point of view, the, the differences to panda pipes is uh, is quite straightforward to to include in in, uh, in mosaic because it's, it's Python code, uh, and uh, you can use uh, the, the API from panda pipes directly for the tool coupling in Python. So this uh, this whole simulator, uh, so so this this components API that I that I described before from 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 mosaic basically uses the API. Uh, from from panda pipes, and basically what you can do is in panda pipes it's called controllers, but uh, you can call you can use them to to uh, to implement the coupling points for the co simulation, and they help you to to really read the values from the network, to apply efficiency factors and unit conversions basically to uh, to 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 control the network and, and 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 its interfaces, and then you can write the results to another network. So basically, that's everything you need to to implement the co-simulation, uh, and and it's uh, uh, it's uh, once you understand this this concept of of this uh, uh, simulation API, oh, sorry, com uh, component API from Mosaic, then it's uh, relatively straightforward to include panda pipes into Mosaic simulation. A uh, DC clip, on the other hand, uh, that's in Modelica, so that's not so straightforward to to include. Uh, but what you can do is you can export the models. Uh, as uh, standalone executables uh, using the, the functional mockup interface specification. Uh, and those, I mean, this is the binary code, more or less, that you can export, uh, and you can use this binary code then um, in, to, to, to include it into, uh, into Mosaic. Uh, I, I think I mentioned before that part of this Mosaic uh, environment or ec ecosystem uh, uh, includes uh, the coupling with uh, FMI compatible or FMI compliant uh, simulation tools. Uh, and yeah, also worth to mention. So in case you you're interested in doing something similar yourself, so Panda Pipes is really publicly available, open source Python package, uh, and and since uh, Python is also publicly available, 
with open source, you, you, you can really use Panda pipes quite easily, also in a code simulation without any commercial license or so on. Uh, for DC Clip, that's a bit different. The DC Clip itself, so the model, is publicly available in open source. So the library is, is open source. But for compiling the models uh, from the DC Clip to these executables, so you, it is, uh, to, to compile it into FMI compatible uh, standalone executable, you need a proprietary tool. Uh, and that's, yeah, this is this is not public here as such. Uh, but hopefully, uh, in the future, there will be a complete open source tool support for open modelica, where you can also use DC Clip uh, completely, so like for the whole tool chain for free. Uh, for now, in, 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 in the, uh, in, the uh, in the example, so in this tutorial here, there is this uh, there is this compiled model is included there, and you can use it without a license. But of course, you I mean you can you can change the parameters and everything, but you you cannot directly go into the model and change something like uh, uh, change one pipe to something else or something or, uh, or add another consumer. So that that's unfortunately not possible. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I would just to, to give a bit in, a bit of uh, overview of, of how this could look like, so of how this this model actually looks like, and to give you a, a feeling of how you could model such a such a system uh, using this 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 library. Uh, there, there's some pictures here, so the, the following pictures are basically more or less screenshots uh, out of uh, out of Daimler. So Daimler is the tool that is used to compile this model into executable, uh, and what you see here is that. Uh, the, the modeling of, of of the firm network is actually, since this is a Daimler model, uh, sorry, since this is a Modelica model, uh, really, uh, uh, like, well, so it basically, you model the system like it was the real system. So you have a component that represents the external grid, you have a component that represents the consumers, you have the pipes, and so for both for the return to supply line, uh, you see there are there are, uh, components uh, on its own. You, you can even model the pipe junctions where you basically where the lines split and 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 and, and come together, and it also sorry uh, you see here also there is uh, uh, one component that represents the power to heat uh, facility, and you can also zoom in there and it's the same here. So you see that these the, this blue bluish and blue whitish uh, points here are, are represent uh, uh, the inputs and outputs, or the, the inlets and outlets from from the supply and the return line, uh, and you can also see here. So it's really modeled in detail. The the, the thermal, the uh, sorry, the the, the the hydraulic loops from uh, from the heat pump and the storage tank and the pump that uh, uh, the the pump that that feeds the storage tank, the pump that uh, feeds the supply line, and, and so on and so on. So this is all really in very high detail. And so, so the modeling, since this is uh, object-oriented modeling. This is it's quite straightforward if, if you have the components because you can say, okay, that's what my system looks like. And, and you basically put the component here uh, and uh, you connect them. And this is, uh, uh, it feels like, yeah. So, so, it's, so it's easy to understand how the, how the model looks like if, if you do it in, in, in this graphic way. You see here, yeah, the supply line, you, you have the models for the heat pump again, storage tank. You have this uh, first hydraulic loop that I was, uh, that I already mentioned before, and here the other one uh, feeding into the supply line. Yeah. And basically, this model then uh, is uh, exported, as I said before, as the standalone executable binary, so, 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 FMU, functional mockup unit. Uh, and you see here this, this whole system model, as I showed you before, with the inputs and outputs, is here just a sub model. Uh, and what's actually added here is a PID controller uh, for regulating. Uh, for regulating the power consumption of uh, for regulating the power consumption of the heat pump based of the set point coming from uh, uh, coming from the voltage controller. But otherwise, you see here that the inputs and outputs of of this executable binary. Are, so you you have the thermal system model, you have the PID controller. Uh, sorry, that uh, that regulates the mass flow through the heat pump condenser based on on the set point set point from from uh, from the flex heat controller, uh, and then in addition, you just have uh, outputs, uh, basically the, the, the measurements from from tank temperature, uh, and 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 uh, the measurement of the actual heat pump power consumption, and that is really then uh, uh, translated into one binary executable, and you can use it really as as, as one as one big model of of the thermal domain. As I said before, uh, if you go 
here on GitHub, uh, you can. Uh, so you, you, if you follow the link that I posted before, you can here via launch binder, you can go there. It, so it, I, I can guarantee you that it works, but uh, it sometimes takes a long time until those uh, uh, until those things uh, then really start to to spin up uh, on, 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 on the cloud. So it might take some time. So that's again why I uh, why I'm using a, a local uh, a local installation of the whole thing. But if you follow the link or if you click the button to to go there, basically where you will end up with is here. Uh, again, you you start here with a welcome screen, um, and basically what you can do first is uh, here under resources there is uh, no sorry yeah, under precise documentation um, you will find and it's also on GitHub but you can also find it here. Uh, you can find very detailed descriptions of everything that's in this in this benchmark. So, for example, um, uh, you can go into uh, you can take a, a look into the controller and take a, a closer look into the specification of the voltage controller. Yeah. So that's really a, a longer document with everything defined in detail and, and so on. And, and the same is true. Uh, sorry. The same is true, for example, for uh, I don't know for the system configuration. So there is. Uh, um, there, there is extensive documentation of, of all the components uh, in this use case, of all the pipes, of all the cables, of uh, the heat pump, of the con consumer. So everything is very well documented in, in these documents. Okay. But there's also the implementations. So there is uh, the two implementations, the one with uh, panel pipes and panel power, and the one with the DC clip and panel power. I will uh, because just because I'm more familiar with it, I, I, I will run this one. Uh, so and there is now two Python notebooks. The one is called Benchmark Book the Energy Sim. So that's really the simulation. If I open that, uh, basically what you will find here is uh, uh, the, the main script for for my mosaic simulation. Uh, you basically the details are hidden here in the, in these Python files. But if you go there, you will find uh, that it, if you also go onto simulators and resources and so. You will find all the mosaic things that, that I was talking before. So you have the simulators and to provide the meta information. Uh, you have the couplings to the to the models uh, to, to power factory. I'm uh, sorry to, to Panda power via this approach that I was talking about before. Let me run this first. Uh, and to to the FM, to, to the network model via the FMU and, and so on and so on. So everything is there. So if you if you want to know. Um, uh, how, how the things run and, and how they're done in detail, how the couplings are done and, and, and everything. So it, it's all there and it's, it's all available. Uh, so you see, okay, the simulation has started, so it's not running super fast, but probably uh, we can wait a bit for it. Uh, probably not. I was hoping for this to run longer, uh, to, to run faster, uh, but that's probably because it's on my laptop. But you see, so this is, I think, a simulation for a couple of days. This is now with uh, mm, so here the flex. The voltage controller is not enabled, so this would be kind of simulating uh, the reference case. I don't do yeah. And uh, okay, basically you can run it here. You will get the results uh, in 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 uh, in a separate file, uh, and you can then come again and run the same thing again with. Uh, the voltage controller enabled and also with, and also writing the thing in, in, in the new in a new in a new output file and then there is uh, this second notebook uh, where you basically get uh, where you can compare the simulation results so so here the the, the, the results are already there because i have i've run it before uh, and you can really go then here into, into the details of so for example you'll see uh, in high detail you can see uh, the temperature uh, the, the, the evolution of the temperature with respect to time in the tank. So for for uh, in the lower parts of the tank or in the upper parts of the tank. Or you can see the mass flow from the tank. You can see uh, the power consumption from from the heat pumps, for example. And if you go into more detail, so here you see the voltage controller that depending on uh, the voltage levels, uh, really via the PID. I'm sorry, via via, via this. Uh, uh, this, this this logic that I showed you before then really sets uh, uh, really sets the set point for 
uh, really sets the set point for the heat pump. And if you go into more detail, then uh, you, you you will find how these different things interact. Uh, and so, for example, you then also see the comparison further down below here. Uh, for example, for no, 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 no. here for um, uh, the voltage at, at bus one uh, with the controller enabled and disabled, and you see if it's disabled, you have uh, you have voltage violations, especially uh, uh, you you so especially in the lower band. So it goes down to 0.8, and in this in this specific case, it should be between uh, 0.9 and 1.1 uh, uh, PU. Uh, and you see if you enable the controller, uh, so this effect is so it's not perfect, but uh, at least it's. Uh, it's much better than, than it was before, right? Uh, so you see that the voltage control is uh, is, is reasonably working, and, and you can compare uh, and look into detail what, what's going on if you lose the voltage control or not. And I, I can get I can guarantee you. So if you, I mean, this is now a lot of a uh, lot of lot of graphics or a lot of figures at once. Uh, but if you if you if you start looking here into detail, you will you will find a lot of. Uh, a lot of interesting details how the how, how the whole things interact so for example you will see uh, that the tank temperatures so going up and down and, and all this this funny stuff that's happening here is very well correlated uh, with uh, here with uh, uh, the power consumption of the heat pump and and, and this is of course related to, to, to the control signals and, and so on and so on so you feel uh, and I remember so we went, when we developed this benchmark, we, we started to play around and, and found very soon that there's a lot of things going on and a lot of things that that you could improve or that you could also break here. And this is exactly the idea here that you have um, that you have a system that you can play around with where you can really look at the full complexity of the system uh, and, and and play around with it and, and see uh, what can you do with it and what not. Uh, and I, I would also encourage you to explore some things with this online demo. So uh, you can, first of all, you can run the second uh, reference implementation that using that uses panel pipes uh, and compare the results with the implementation that uses statistically. Uh, you can also take a look at the source code. That's kind of an advanced feature, but still. And you can look at how are the Python based simulators integrated into Mosaic. So especially panda power, panda pipes, but also the controllers. So just as a hint, so it's a uh, if you understand the, the, the simple mosaic demos that uh, I told you before, you will also at least understand the mosaic part of this uh, uh, of this source code. And but you can also and that's a really advanced step probably. But you could also take a look at how this uh, uh, this this heat, lab, this heat lip model is integrated into mosaic as FMU. So that's kind of very advanced use cases where you can uh, that, that you can take as reference probably for for similar things that you would like to do. Yeah, and that already, so that brings me finally to the conclusion. So I hope I was able to convince you that uh, co-simulation can be or is a powerful approach for the assessment of multi-domain energy systems. So it's definitely not the only possible approach, but it can be uh, under very uh, under many circumstances be uh, the, the, the most feasible and and and, and uh, yeah, the most feasible and, and the most practical approach to 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 get things achieved. Uh, the Mosaic framework is really a nice tool that I can only recommend to use in this case. So if you're a Python user already, uh, Mosaic will, will, will you, and you want to do co-simulation, then Mosaic will be able to help you with, with many things and you won't have to, 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 to write things from scratch and uh, make errors that others already have done. So I can only recommend uh, going there or at least use Mosaic to learn uh, what's probably missing for your uh, specific use case. Uh, and, and then think about how to uh, uh, where to go further or how, how to improve there. And also uh, this uh, multi-energy network benchmark that I showed in the end. So I think it's a very nice use case for using co-simulation also to show how to couple multi-domains. Uh, in this case, we have power and heat and control, so that's already a lot. Uh, of course, it's still missing. There's no ICT in that case, but uh, uh, yeah, that's that's another story. Uh, it also demonstrates how to connect domain specific simulators. So I already covered that. So there's a different phase how you do that and how it's done here. And of course, it that's I mean that's why you actually do the whole thing. You don't do co simulation because it's so much fun. Uh, but you do co simulation because you want to have a combined analysis of all the domains in high detail. So you can really zoom in 
and that's why I said you, you can look at, for example, these different figures in a lot of detail and, and, and learn a lot of things. You can really zoom in in high detail and understand the entire system and what the, what the different things are doing uh, and get a better understanding of, of how to improve things or how to break things or what, what, what to look out for. OK, so that would be it from my side. Just uh, before we come back to the probably to the last Q&A part, uh, just here, here we are that uh, I also put some links here. So for the benchmark itself, for the online demo, but also for Mosaic and, and, and all the simulators that we were using. And so, OK, so so good so far. Uh, that that would it be from my side. If there are questions, I'm 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 happy to uh, to stay around for a couple more minutes. Many thanks, Edmund, for the nice uh, introduction about co-simulation. Yeah, there are three additional uh, no now four uh, questions that we need to come to an end uh, uh, to stay in time. The first uh, two, the I think they are uh, should be easy to uh, explain. In this work, are you assuming meshed uh, network or radial network and unbalanced distribution systems analysis is possible or not? So in this benchmark, we, we don't have meshed networks. So the, the, the electrical network is just two lines, two consecutive lines. And in theory, also the, uh, the, the, the heat network is, is, let's say, radial. But in the heat network is quite complicated in the end from, from a hydraulic point of view because you have the heat bump that uh, uses the return line uh, as, as, a, as a heat sink. And also as as a feed in for uh, uh, for, for for the pressure vessel uh, for, so for for the storage tank, uh, and that makes it from a hydraulic point of view already quite advanced. Uh, and otherwise, uh, for for the electrical network, you could uh, I mean we we kept it simple on purpose, but you could use uh, more advanced models with uh, uh, with three phase uh, simulation and and, and 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 so. But this is really up to you. So that, that that's a nice thing about co simulation. If you're not happy with the model, you can just, you know, try to use a different model and, and plug it in and, and do your own analysis. Yeah, that, that should be possible. Good, many thanks. And there was a comment that uh, is uh, one of the uh, um, attendees uh, has now confidence that uh, with the, all the material, he would be able to start learning Mosaic and uh, do some co simulations. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. There's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of documentation out there. I I can really recommend to to look at it. Um, and when in doubt, you can always also contact the, the developers. So uh, in my experience, they are they are very nice and very helpful. And there's another question: uh, if there's like a tutorial from Mosaic available that uh, integrates electrical network simulation and com communication network simulation as well as cybersecurity analysis. I don't know all the Mosaic stuff. I have to admit, but since there is a coupling to Omnet Plus Plus or Omnet Plus Plus, I would think that there is at least a at least a basic uh, a basic example of how to use it and. Uh, Again, since this is co-simulation, then once you know how to use one simulator, you should be able to connect those things and put them together and then make a combined analysis. So, but this, but if, if something like this is, is available out of the box, I don't know. Then I posted also a link to the tutorials uh, in the uh, documentation um, pages of to of uh, mosaic uh, and as Edmund said uh, it's, uh, if you have specific questions please also feel free to get in contact with the um, developers uh, from office exactly what is the difference another and this is the final question i think that we answer with since we are at the end of the of the time today what is the difference between co-simulation and software in the loop Yeah, software in the loop is something that you want to run in real time because uh, you want to understand the artifacts of the software that you're testing. I mean, not 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 like a logic, lo logical flow or something, but really something like uh, uh, can you do, I don't know, can you hack it via some some buffer overruns or whatever? Yeah? Uh, that That's what I would consider software in the loop. Whereas in, in, in co-simulation, you, you run simulation models and 
they don't necessarily they typically don't have to run in real time or you don't uh, you're not interested if if you can hack them or something so that, that that's very i mean it's connected it, it's similar but it's it's let's say the intention behind is different Good, many thanks then uh, for answering all the questions, uh, Edmund. Many thanks also for all the attendees, uh, and especially also for Edmund uh, that um, uh, did this tutorial. As said, uh, we are sharing the recordings and the slides uh, uh, after the end of the uh, training series uh, during this week. I hope you enjoyed uh, the first part. You are kindly invited uh, to join the second part, which takes uh, place tomorrow, which is more related to uh, outcomes uh, of the uh, uh, Synergy uh, project, another European project uh, that is uh, doing together a tutorial with us. Uh, and the topic is on integrated energy service, cyber security issues, and analytical uh, services. So many thanks. Uh, and I uh, hope to see a lot of you also during tomorrow's uh, uh, second part. So let's close the meeting. Uh, many thanks to all of you. Thank you for attending. Bye.